see the dawn of the darkest day Christ on the road to Calvary Tried by sinful men Torn and beaten then Nailed to a cross of wood This the power of the cross Christ became sin for us Took the blame amazing important moments in all of history are you ready for it okay three two one were you expecting something a bit more flashy than that for one of the most important moments in all of history well 
as we go to looking through the Good Friday story, the story of the day that Jesus died on the cross, I want you to listen out for the moment that I just reenacted. And then we're going to work out why that moment helps us to see that Good Friday is really good. Because sometimes it's hard to see that because it's the day that Jesus died and that's really sad. But let's dive into the story and see what we can find. So Jesus was hung up on the cross at about nine o'clock in the morning. And when he was hung up there, lots of people just really wanted to mock Jesus. And they put this sign up above him that said, Jesus, the King of the Jews, which it sounds good. It sounds like they're saying he's a king and that's great, isn't it? But they didn't really think he was. They put it there to make fun of him. They put a criminal on either side of him on another cross as well. And the criminals and all the people looking on, they just wanted to mock Jesus. They said things like, save yourself if you're really the king. And they just laughed at him. That's what Jesus was going through. And he kept going through this. And then it got to about noon, which is the middle of the day. And something strange happened. Do you know what it is? Yeah, that strange thing is that it went all dark. In the middle of the day, it went all dark. And that's really strange. And it stayed dark until the afternoon at about three o'clock. All afternoon, the whole place had gone dark. And then we hear just how sad and hurt and pained Jesus is by all of this. He says something, he cries it out really. And that shows us exactly how sad he is. We see Jesus' sadness and pain when he cries out and says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is really hurt by what he's going through on the cross. And then a few moments later, he breathes his last breath and he dies. And at that very moment, the curtain in the temple, it's just torn in two. It just tears in two by itself. And then a man watching on says, surely this man was the son of God. Now, why do you think the temple curtain tore in two? Did you notice that? That was that moment that I was acting out before. Well, the temple curtain, you see, it was this symbol of the fact that there was a problem between people and God. There was a barrier between people and God. They couldn't just go to him and be his friend. And that's because of all the times that we turn our back on God. Those are the reason that we couldn't be friends with God. And so when that curtain tore into, it showed the whole wide world that Jesus had taken away that barrier. When he died, he took the punishment for our sins so that we could be forgiven. And all those times that we turn our back on God, they don't stand in between us and God anymore. So the reason Good Friday is really truly good is that Jesus is taking away that problem so that we can be friends with God and that nothing stands between us. Why don't we pray and thank God for this now. God, thank you that Jesus died on the cross for us, that he took away the punishment for our sin so that we could be friends with you again. Help us to trust Jesus and turn to him for forgiveness. Amen. Uh, well, now we're going to have our Bible reading from Julianne, and that'll be in Psalm 22. We're now going to read Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you. 
even at my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast on you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions that tear their prey, open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people in the assembly. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honour him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. This reading is Mark chapter 15, starting at verse 25. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. 
dreadful to watch the suffering of others, whether it's the suffering of a loved one in hospital or even the suffering of a stranger. Our humanity rightly makes us want to turn aside from it, to put it out of our minds. The death of Jesus is brutal, horrific and very confronting. I find it so appalling that I don't want to think about the horror of it all. We instinctively recoil from pondering what Jesus went through on the cross. But I want to say that this is something that we should do, especially on this day. The Gospel accounts of the death of Jesus are written so that we might understand what Jesus endured for us and what he thereby achieved for us. Rather than turn aside in revulsion or shame, we actually need to gaze upon the cross and to see our Saviour writhing there and then understand the full significance of Pilate's words, this is your king. It would be bad enough if Jesus were a criminal who had deserved to, to die like this. Crucifixion was a cruel and barbaric torture. If Jesus were to allow his body weight to be borne by the nails through his wrists, then he suffered excruciating fiery pain. And as he hung like this, Jesus was unable to exhale. And so the carbon dioxide would gradually build up, leading to asphyxiation. But to relieve this, if Jesus pushed himself upwards, he placed his full weight on the nails driven through his ankles, which was itself another form of searing agony. For, for hours, Jesus was arriving from one agony to the next as he fought to raise himself for every precious breath. To bring death more quickly, the executioner would sometimes break the legs of the victim, ensuring that they could not raise themselves to breathe, bringing a rapid suffocation. But for Jesus, there was no such relief. But even if Jesus had been a terrible criminal, I doubt that we could bear to have watched this. Surely even a criminal would not deserve to die a death like this. But Jesus was not a criminal. The Roman governor Pontius Pilate had declared, I find no basis for a charge against this man. That fact compounds the awfulness of it. Jesus was mocked, spat upon, whipped, beaten and struck upon the face, and it was all undeserved. If ever there was a man who deserved to be spared from all of this, Jesus was that man. But for all of this, if we merely focus on the horrors of a death by crucifixion, or if we merely focus on the brutal mistreatment of an innocent man, then we've actually missed the most awful part of the, of the death of Jesus. The Gospel accounts don't in fact dwell upon the physical agony, or indeed about the shame and humiliation, because Jesus underwent a far greater agony, agony on that day. The key to understanding the true horror of the cross comes from a psalm, a psalm which is quoted from or alluded to in each of the four gospel accounts. That psalm is Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is quoted in John 19, when it says of the soldiers at the cross, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Matthew, Matthew's Gospel echoes this same psalm when it records the Jewish leaders saying to Jesus, He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Luke 23 alludes to verse 7 of the psalm. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. But perhaps the most famous quotation of Psalm 22 is on the lips of Jesus himself, when he cried out from the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These words, taken from the first verse of Psalm 22, explain why the cross is so dreadful. On the cross, Jesus is experiencing what it is to be forsaken, 
abandoned by God. On the cross, we see a God forsaken one. In fact, we see the God forsaken God. Psalm 22 is a psalm of King David. It's a psalm that reflects on a time in David's life when his enemies have sought to overthrow the king and it looks like the enemies have the upper hand. Not only do all the people hurl insults and mock him and despise him, but worst of all, it seems that God himself has forsaken David. Nevertheless, David, by the end of the psalm, still expresses his confidence that God will indeed deliver him from death, that he will not forsake him to the grave. Jesus quoted Psalm 22 as he hung there on the cross because he knew himself to be fulfilling it. As I read this series of verses from Psalm 22, which were David's in the first instance, I want to mentally picture Jesus on the cross. Verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? Verse 6, I'm scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Verse 16, a band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Jesus was the ultimate afflicted one that this psalm describes. He was God's chosen king whom the enemies of God were triumphing over. Today is the day when we recall that Jesus was forsaken by God in a way that King David never was. King David ultimately was delivered from his enemies. He was saved from death, but Jesus was forsaken unto death. In the death of Jesus, God turned his face away. God allowed evil men to triumph. God allowed them to take the life of his precious son. There is, of course, more that needs to be said. There was a deliverance beyond the grave, which we'll talk about on Easter Day. But let us not bypass the horror of Good Friday. In the death of Jesus, he died as the God forsaken one. It was this that Jesus wrestled with in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus, the Son of God, who had always enjoyed a perfect, uninterrupted relationship with his heavenly Father, faced the prospect of a rupture in that relationship. God was going to allow his son to die, to allow his appointed king to be defeated by the enemies, to allow his beloved one to perish as a forsaken one. It was this that Jesus wrestled with as he prayed, Father, if it is possible, take this cup from me. And this is something that we must wrestle with too. What could bring God to do such a thing? Why would Jesus go willingly to his death, knowing what awaited him there? The answer is that Jesus had to be forsaken in this way, in order to overcome our own God-forsakenness. Humanity has forsaken God. We've turned our backs on him. We don't have that perfect relationship with God that Jesus had. Our forsakenness means separation from God. We are, we are estranged from him and God from us. Indeed, the Bible's definition of hell is a permanent estrangement from God, to be eternally forsaken by God. This is not what God wants for us, which is why he sent his son to be forsaken in our place. Jesus' death is the solution to our estrangement. He was forsaken in our place. The Apostle Paul puts it this way. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the unfathomable mystery of the gospel. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. When Jesus died on the cross, he died under God's curse for sin. Jesus died to bear the forsakenness that we deserved. As uncomfortable as it is, today is a day for gazing upon the cross of Christ 
in wonder and amazement and letting it speak to us. The cross has some very powerful things to say to us. The cross of Christ says to us, you are not God forsaken. Regardless of what we have done in our lives, God has not abandoned us. He has not withdrawn himself from us. The barriers that my sin and yours have caused between us and God have been dealt with by another who bore the curse that we deserve. So the cross says to us, you are not God forsaken. The cross of Christ also declares to us just how much God loves us and the lengths to which God has gone to draw us back into a relationship with him. As it says in that most famous of verses, John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, gave him over to die a God-forsaken death. Why? That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so the cross of Christ says to us, don't remain a stranger. It says, God has not forsaken you, but don't remain estranged from him. Are you still keeping God at a distance? Jesus died to bring us back into a relationship with his heavenly father. Jesus let his perfect relationship with the father be ruptured for the sake of including us in that relationship. The cross asks us, are we, a spur are we spurning that offer? and treating as nothing what Jesus did for us. The cross also says to us, here is your king. These were the mocking words of Pilate, who spoke them without realising the full significance of what he had said. It's these words that are the most confronting of all. As we gaze at the cross, as we see Jesus writhing, bleeding, dying, what we see is exposed, broken, vulnerable humanity, and it looks anything but kingly. But the reality is that this is God's anointed king of Psalm 22. This is the one that God has raised up, that all people must submit to, the one whom God has appointed as ruler over all. This is not our vision of a mighty king, which only goes to show us how corrupted our notions of kingship are. This king rules by suffering and service. This king overcomes by giving of himself. This king triumphs through weakness and death. And this king calls us to follow him. As we gaze on the cross of Christ, and as we hear it say these things to us, it's calling us on us to make a response, a threefold response. Firstly, it should call for a response of awe and thankfulness. We should be lost in wonder that our God should love us so much as to forsake his own son. Our hearts should be filled with thankfulness to the Lord Jesus who did this for us. Just realize the magnitude of what he went through for us. It was not just the bitterness of desertion and betrayal by friends. It was not just the shame of mocking humiliation. It was not just the physical agony of his, agony of his passion and cross. Jesus endured the very worst of all, being forsaken by his heavenly Father. And he did that knowingly and willingly for your sake and for mine to include us into a perfect relationship with the Father. Awe and wonder. Secondly, the cross calls on us to respond in repentance. It calls us to turn from our indifference to God and our rejection of him. For far too many people, Jesus remains the perfect stranger. Time and time again, they hear about this message about Jesus' sacrifice on their behalf. Yes, Jesus is the perfect one, the perfect one who's taken the penalty that we deserve. But they stop there. And if we stop there, Jesus remains to us nothing more than a perfect stranger. Indeed, it's about keeping him as a stranger in our lives. But to do this is to miss out on the very thing that Jesus laid down his life for. 
Jesus was estranged from God in order to overcome our estrangement from God. So to all of us, the cross is saying, don't remain a stranger. Pray to God and ask him to bring you back into a relationship with him through what Jesus did for you on the cross. And finally, the cross calls us to commit our lives to Christ as our king. Psalm 22 reminds us that God's anointed king is also a suffering servant. And so as we follow Christ as our king, expect that it will take us to places of suffering and service. And to do this, giving of ourselves in humility, to overcome, not by might, but by weakness, the cross holds up to us the example of our master and beckons us to follow him. This is a day for gazing on the cross and seeing there our God forsaken God who endured the cross for our sake. It is a day of response, of wonder, of awe, of humility, of love and dedication. Let us use this day as God intends. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you, because of your great love for us, you have been prepared to rupture the relationship with your son to include us in it. Help us to respond to you rightly on this day and enter into that fullness of relationship with you through Jesus Christ, our suffering Saviour and King, in whose name we pray. Amen. Good morning. My name's Peter. Please join me in prayer. Almighty and Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you in prayer this morning. We thank you, merciful God, for the death of Christ and for bringing us into relationship with you through his amazing sacrifice. We ask that you would give us hearts that long for the coming kingdom and the eternal security we have in heaven through Jesus. You are holy and righteous. Thank you that your character is just. Thank you that you showed mercy on our wrongdoing and sent Jesus in your abundant grace. Thank you that sending him as a saviour was part of your plan all along. Thank you that Jesus lived the perfect life, submitted himself to death and rose from the dead. Thank you that he has beaten evil and defeated Satan. Help us to wait patiently for him to return. Father, we pray for our churches this Easter. Help us to be unified and passionate about people coming to know and love you. Help us in new ways to be welcoming, unselfish and caring. Help us to have hearts after your own heart that care about seeing people saved. Thank you for the launch of Splash Online. Thank you for our leaders. Please help them to maintain good relationships and ministry with the kids despite this being by distance. Have mercy on the kids who don't know you. We pray for our church leaders. Help them to proclaim your word clearly and truthfully. Bless Ken and Janet, Lauren, Ben and Ash with wisdom as they lead us into the uncertain times ahead. We pray for our diocesan leaders, Archbishop Glenn Davies and our Bishop Michael Stead. We thank you for their work in the diocese and ask that you strengthen them as they face challenges and as they seek to live a godly and holy life in the public eye. Please bless Chris and Beth Braga as they commence at Glenmore Park and Mulgoa. Help them to build relationships despite the challenge of not being able to meet face to face with their new parishioners. We pray for you to provide someone suitable to be our new rector at Summer Hill. Father, continue to bless our federal, state and local leaders with wisdom as they navigate the country through the current COVID-19 crisis. Protect doctors, nurses and paramedics as they put themselves at risk to help others. Finally, please deepen our hearts to willingly and joyfully serve and to be open to new ways of serving Christ in all parts of our lives. Fill us with your spirit so that we may offer consistent Christian witness in our lives to our family, friends, neighbours and work colleagues. 
Almighty Father, look graciously upon this, your family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given up into the hands of wicked men, and to suffer death upon the cross. Merciful God, you have made all people, and hate nothing you have made, nor do you desire the death of a sinner, but rather that they should be converted and live. Have mercy on all who do not know you, or who deny the faith of Christ crucified. Take from them all ignorance, hardness of heart, and contempt of your word, and bring them home to your fold, blessed Lord, so that they may become one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of glory died. My richest gain I count the loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Oh 